you so much for being with us. Uh, this is the uh, second program in the Baylor Business Forum, and we're so grateful to Baylor University for giving us at the World Affairs Council an opportunity to be a part of it. You know, as the world really began to get locked down, shut down last March, uh, our World Affairs Council quickly made the switch from in-person events to the virtual world. And our very first Zoom speaker, hard to believe almost a full year ago, joins us once again, and that's Sebastian Malaby. He's the Paul A. Volcker Senior Fellow for International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. And I really cannot think of a sharper mind to help us discuss the challenges presented by the pandemic, both with our healthcare systems, not just in the United States, but globally, as well as the global economy. I am Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And when we last spoke with Sebastian, we certainly had no idea how long the pandemic would, would, would last. Uh, today, Sebastian is joined by our moderator, Baylor University's Blaine McCormick, and they'll be discussing uh, all of these issues and much more. And we want to encourage all of you to ask questions, just put them in the Q&A box and Blaine and Sebastian will get to just as many of them as they can. Uh, I think you saw as we started the uh, upcoming schedule but to keep up, just go to our website at dfwworld.org. And with that, again, I wanna thank Steve Gardner uh, with the Hancock School of Business. He is the Herman Brown Professor of Economics and Director of the McBride Center for International Business at Baylor University. And I'm glad to see Steve that you knew to turn off your mute button. So I turn it over to you and I look forward to muting mine and listening to the continuation of the program. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Jim. We at Baylor are just so pleased to be uh, working with World Affairs Council on this series. We've, we've had just a wonderful relationship for decades between Baylor University and the World Affairs Council, and this is a great way to continue that. Uh, now, I'm looking forward to our conversation today between uh, Sebastian Malaby and Blaine McCormick. Uh, as, as you just mentioned, uh, Sebastian uh, who's joining us from, from London today is the Paul Volcker Senior Fellow of International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. He writes frequently for the Washington Post, for the Atlantic, and other publications. Some of us who are here today had the good fortune of meeting him in Dallas a couple of years ago when he was introducing his newest book at that time, uh, The Man Who Knew the Life and Times of Alan Greenspan, which won a Financial Times McKinsey Book of the Year Award. Sebastian will be interviewed today by my good friend and colleague, Blaine McCormick, who is himself an accomplished author and has served as chair of our management department and associate dean of our business school at Baylor. So thank you for leading our discussion today, Sebastian and Blaine, and thank you all for coming. Thanks to all for joining. I just moused it down here at the bottom and we have over 100 participants already there, and I will start monitoring that uh, question box uh, in about 15 minutes and uh, diving in there. But I wanted to start uh, with Sebastian um, uh, with a, a tweet I saw uh, last summer that just, you know, you see so many tweets and a few of them stick in your, stick in your head. And this one did. And so it's a writer at the Atlantic, Derek Thompson. And uh, he tweeted out last July, he said, swear to God, the NBA, National Basketball Association, swear to God, the NBA and the Fed are the only remotely competent 20th century institutions left in this country. Uh, yeah. Very clever uh, in there, but Sebastian, let's uh, start out here. Um, given your foreign affairs article uh, last summer on the age of magic money, this happened about the same time. Um, how would you respond to uh, this tweet here? The only remotely competent 20th century institutions left in this country, take it away. So Blaine, first of all, I'm happy that you're asking me to comment on the Fed bit of this, not the NBA bit of this. <laughs> I, you can tell by my accent, I didn't grow up in Arkansas and I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a natural basketball player or expert. But on the Fed, I do know a few things. And um, I'd say that that's correct, that, that you know, the Fed has lasted into the 21st century and indeed grown and grown in stature, grown in efficacy and become a bigger part of uh, stabilizing the US economy. Um, the piece that you allude to, The Age of Magic Money, uh, which I wrote last year, sort of sets out the idea that 
we've entered a period when the Fed's power to create new money um, is, for the moment at least, unconstrained mm -hmm. by the traditional problem. The traditional problem was you create too much money, you get inflation. Well, for various reasons we can get into, that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, and so long as you don't get inflation, the Fed can just carry on making more and more and more money. And that has proved to be useful in the wake of the uh, 08 great financial crisis, but useful even more so during COVID where the Fed has really uh, you know, done everything it can to support the economy with, uh, with monetary policy. Uh, and so I think it, you're right, uh, it is a competent institution. It's, it's been amazing uh, to watch the past uh, decade, uh, for sure. I would say it surprised me on a couple of occasions with uh, what they've done. Um, on this you know, unconstrained uh, uh, creation of, of money, uh, let's, let's just tackle that. But can you tell us two or three events or persons that led us up to this moment? Let's just get a little history under our belt here to inform of where we go. Yeah, I mean, I think the three individuals I would single out uh, are simply the three Fed chairmen um, who, who I think sort of created the modern Fed. Paul Volcker, uh, who was chosen in 1979 and served until 1987, was the leader who forced inflation down from double digits uh, into a sort of the modern era of kind of three percentish inflation by the time he left. Um, so that was a huge achievement. He had to face down all kinds of resistance because it created two recessions to do that. And that was a very tough time for the nation. Uh, but Volcker persisted. He was not bullied uh, by the politicians or he, he stuck up to that bullying. And so he, he got inflation under control. Uh, his successor was Alan Greenspan. Um, he is the one I wrote the biography of, and he was in charge from 1987 to 2006. And I think his achievement, in a sense, was to extend uh, Volcker's one, in the sense that it's one thing, you know, Volcker came in in 79 when, if you looked at opinion polls, high inflation was the main thing Americans worried about. It was kind of like COVID now almost. Mm -hmm. People were obsessed with inflation being out of control. So the Fed had a decent amount of public support in fighting inflation. When Greenspan uh, came in in 1987, that uh, crisis um, was over. And most people expected that Greenspan would not sustain this low inflation environment. They thought he was a political stooge, that he would do what the government wanted, that if the government wanted him to be supportive of job creation and growth, even when inflation was too high, he would do that. And Greenspan proved them wrong. Uh, and he cemented the sort of political stature of the Fed. And then Bernanke is the Fed leader who came after that. Uh, he was there between um, 2006 and 2014. And his achievement was to be there during the great financial crisis mm -hmm. and to roll out these extraordinary tools of uh, quantitative e easing, the, the creation of money and on a larger scale than people had thought imaginable. And so he really innovated the toolkit uh, and made the Fed what it is today. Well, um, I don't know the age profile of our audience out here, but uh, as I think through it, I lived through uh, the 70s, born in 66, lived through the 70s. I was quite young, but I uh, do remember this inflation. And by the time it was under control, uh, it's conceivable that we've got an entire generation of Americans who really don't know that environment. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people who are tuned in today remember those years uh, very vividly, uh, but uh, we have uh, a good deal of the population that's uh, never lived in this. And so um, uh, thanks for the overview. If we are in like, this Bernanke toolkit uh, was innovative. Uh, it surprised me. Uh, it's continued uh, in many ways uh, through the, the next two uh, chairs. But uh, what might bring, you call it the age of magic money. Uh, what might bring an age of magic money to an end, Sebastian? I mean, there's one thing, and that's inflation. If inflation picks up again, uh, and if it's at all sustained, 
then the Fed's traditional constraint will be back again. So it will have to raise interest rates uh, to cut off that inflation, and then it won't be able to be as supportive of economic growth. And we're starting to get some <laughs> questions on this topic, so I'm going to pivot to the first one uh, in the box, honor that there. Um, and it's a little bit of uh, what we just talked about, but it extends it. Uh, Chris puts up, uh, what do you think about the inflation that might result from the money printing the Federal Reserve has done, especially over the last year? So just very recently, especially over the last year, isn't there a lag um, in there? If you could print money without causing inflation, why has it not worked in the past? And so what's different now maybe uh, in there? Why hasn't this, if you can print money without inflation, without causing inflation, why has it not worked in the past? Um, so when one says, why has it not worked? I mean, the question is, what is the it? Is it, it? I mean, let me just give you how I see this. So I think um, starting around uh, the late 90s, um, inflation proved to be lower than the Fed itself had been expecting. Um, and it turned out to be possible to cut interest rates lower than the Fed thought and still not get inflation picking up. So normally the theory was you cut interest rates a lot, that makes it super cheap to borrow, so people will borrow a whole bunch, then they'll go out and spend this money, and that force of spending will be too much money chasing too few goods and you'll get inflation. Um, but it didn't happen. Inflation instead uh, stayed low, then it started to go even lower. The Fed had this initially informal target of 2% inflation, and then it was formalized uh, later on after the 08 crisis. But inflation was falling below that target, uh, even in the 2000s. And the Fed had cut interest rates in 2003, 2004, down to 1%, which was just unimaginably low uh, at the time. And yet inflation really wasn't uh, rearing its head. And it's continued to be that way until now. And so, for example, after 2008 and the crisis, there was enormous amounts of quantitative easing, where money was pumped into the, into the system. Some people did predict a lot of inflation, and it simply didn't happen. Inflation has been below the target, not above it. So, you know, why is this? Well, it's a bunch of things. It's that people are not used to inflation, and so they kind of don't expect it. And expectations can be self-fulfilling, so if no one expects it, you won't get inflation. It's to do with relatively weak uh, labor bargaining power, partly because maybe uh, legislative changes have made it tougher to organize uh, labor unions, partly, I think, more importantly, because of international trade means that there's competition from foreign goods, uh, which can come in cheaply. So if you as a company, you know, pay your people more uh, and put your prices up, um, you will lose business. So you don't do that. So that's another factor. And the third big factor is technology. Um, technology is creating all kinds of goods which we get for free on our cell phones. If you think about, um, you know, I don't know, a, a camera, you used to go out and spend your money on a camera. Now a camera is just a free add-on on your cell phone. Um, so there's lots of stuff where there's price destruction because of uh, technology. And because of all these things, however much the Fed cuts interest rates or even pumps, actively pumps money into the system through quantitative easing, it has not been creating inflation. Now, that could change. Um, and uh, I think there's a decent argument uh, along the lines that um, right now we're in a position where, uh, you know, household balance sheets have gotten stronger during COVID because uh, a lot of people received stimulus checks, obviously. And it's tough to go out and spend the checks because we're meant to be staying at home for the most part. Uh, and therefore, um, you can look at household savings, and this is fairly carefully tracked by the Fed and by others, and uh, normal American families have more money uh, ready to spend than they usually do. On top of that, you've got anyone who has an investment in the stock market, um, and of course the stock market has been on a wild upward tear, and so those people have a, a feeling rich as well. Saying there's a lot of pent-up spending power, and when people are allowed to go out to restaurants freely again to cafes to socialize and do all of that stuff travel etc there could be a big whoosh 
of uh, spending unleashed on the economy, you might then get inflation. And, and that is that would be a game changer. That would be interesting. Now, you mentioned prices as part of this, and we got a question from Rod on prices I'm going to put in here. And there's a couple of ways to think about this one, but he says, with inflation now being curtailed over the last decades, let's assume inflation is indeed curtailed over the last decade. Why is it that product prices still continue to rise? And so Rod is perceiving that product prices are continuing to rise. Uh, another way to frame that is uh, maybe we're having inflation, but we just no longer can recognize it because it's been so long. Uh, but let's fill the question first. Why is it that product prices still continue to rise? Let's tackle that one. Sure. So that's a great question. And um, part of the answer is that you always get some products with prices that are going up. Um, and inflation is a measure of the, the basket of goods that a consumer might buy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the whole basket might not be going up, but some things in the basket will be getting much more expensive. And because we don't like paying more for stuff, we tend to notice those things more because we're kind of annoyed by it. So tuition, <laughs> college tuition, uh, that's not going down. Uh, uh, and so that's an example of something that's been going up. And, you know, there are other things which are uh, normally services, sort of high value services, which are not traded as much. Those things are getting uh, expensive. On the other hand, you know, stuff which is easily traded, whether it's T-shirts uh, or, you know, um, shoes or, or, or even automobiles, those things have uh, generally not had inflation. Um, and certainly if you quality adjust them, in other words, you think about not just, you know, what you might spend on a car today with what you spent 20 years ago, but you look at the fact that now the car is basically a, a computer on wheels, mm -hmm. all kinds of fancy gadgets in it that didn't used to exist. You're getting a lot more for what you're paying for that car than you used to. So um, I think that's the main answer, that the basket of goods can be stable, even if some goods within the basket are getting a lot more expensive. And the uses, I know families that eat more in their automobile than they eat in their home, and that's not meant to be a joke. It's uh, actually a true statement there. And so the multi-use is uh, kind of strange there. So thanks to Rod and Chris for getting these questions uh, out to us. Um, keep those coming. Um, let's say inflation does rear its head. Maybe it has, and we just haven't recognized it yet. I don't think so, uh, but maybe it has. Uh, maybe it will come in here. But if inflation rears its head, let's, uh, you know, Paul Volcker is a name that we've already brought up. It's familiar to you at the Council of Foreign Relations there. If we need another Paul Volcker to show up, uh, you know, will we be able to find him or her, uh, number one, uh, somebody who, you know, can uh, speak to this uh, with that old toolkit, we'll say. And uh, do you have any advice for this, uh, him or her? I actually, Blaine, have a, have a high degree of faith that Volkerism um, has sort of been institutionalized at this point at the Fed so that it's a lot easier to find individuals, you know, who can be the next Paul Volcker. I mean, Paul Volcker himself was an incredible person. I had the good fortune to know him a bit before he died and my uh, chair at the Council for Relations is named after him. Um, uh, so I'm a little bit biased, but I mean, he was this towering figure, both intellectually and physically, enormous tall guy. I think he was six foot seven or something. And he just, he just let criticism bounce off him. He just, you know, would sit there in congressional hearings with members of Congress yelling at him and he would blow cigar smoke. In those days, you were allowed to do that uh, in front of himself like a smoke screen and just kind of shrug. Uh, and, and so he was a special person, but I think his tradition of fighting inflation um, was then institutionalized by Greenspan, who despite expectations, as I was saying earlier, persisted in that Volckerite tradition. And any new Fed leader will understand that their place in the history books will be tied to their ability to maintain control of inflation. So I am not too worried that you know, we're going to get a problem there. I think where the problem comes is if you were to see the Fed leadership around the chairman, the chairperson, um, be filled with too many people who thought differently. So, you know, there's a complicated governance structure within the Federal Reserve System. There are normally seven governors in Washington, DC. 
And then there's uh, 12 uh, heads of the regional feds who are appointed by their local uh, Federal Reserve boards, um, uh, Federal Reserve banks, I should say. And, uh, and there's a kind of rotation system where five out of those 12 at any one time gets to vote on monetary policy. Uh, and so all of that is a slightly complicated system. But I think if you, if you started to see a majority of the folks who were not necessarily the chairman um, uh, questioning the idea that inflation control is the number one priority, uh, that's where you would have a problem. If you go back to the 70s, to the period when inflation was allowed to get out of control, it was partly just because the intellectual consensus then in academia and think tanks and more broadly than just the Fed was that it's not, you know, inflation is just one thing to think about, it's not the main thing. If we were to go back to that time, um, then inflation might break, down, break out, but I, I don't see that for right now. I, for one, don't want to go back to the 70s. I'll take some of the disco music. Some of it's, you know, uh, has aged uh, better than others, but some of it has, but uh, I'd prefer not to go back there. Uh, so let's uh, keep our hopes up there. Let's pivot a bit uh, here, Sebastian. Uh, we'll stay on the uh, Federal Reserve uh, theme a bit, but let's explore how the Federal Reserve can help America's poor. We've mentioned, you know, the stock market, if you're in there, that's gone very well, but not everybody uh, is uh, invested in the stock market. So how, uh, how can we close the inequality gap in an era of magic money? Or is magic money just too weak of a tool to help the disadvantaged? Any thoughts there? Well, the first and important, most important answer is as follows. It's the job of, um, of the, of the fiscal policy, the budget policy, to address inequality. It's not the job of the central bank. Um, so when you're thinking about the US federal budget, there are all kinds of programs, whether it's, um, you know, uh, subsidies for housing for uh, low income families, whether it's the Medicaid program to give free healthcare to low income families, whether it's simply you know, support for various kinds of uh, K through 12 education. Um, obviously that's done at a state level to a very high degree, but um, the federal government is involved in that. And I think that's where one would look, you know, the tax system can be made more progressive or less progressive in terms of how much redistribution you get through the tax system. None of that has anything to do with interest rates or the Federal Reserve. There is a debate about the Fed, um, which I'll just quickly explain which is really, you know, is it a good idea for the Fed to take additional risks with cutting interest rates, even risking a bit of inflation, because that's good for reducing inequality. And the idea is, if you allow inflation to rise a bit, growth will be a little bit faster. That extra growth at the margin helps poor families because it sucks unemployed people into the labor force. And isn't that a good thing? That's called by the fans of this sort of running a high pressure uh, economy. And the reason that's a bad idea is twofold. The first is it might create inflation and then you have to raise interest rates and undo uh, the positive effects for low income families. But also actually um, it's what you alluded to before Blaine, it's that when the Fed runs loose monetary policy, it has two effects. It might create a bit more employment in the short term yeah. uh, and that might help unemployed people, but it also has a massive wealth effect in terms of richer people who have money in the stock market. So inequality will actually go up uh, mm -hmm. on net terms if you cut interest rates. And I was just uh, chatting to an academic this week over email who has done research on this. Uh, so there is evidence on this and it's not a good idea uh, to run interest rates with a view to cutting inequality. Well, it is it just me? And you can say, I think it's just you. Uh, I, you, know, you call me out that way. But it seems to me that the Fed is the one always on camera, expected to do all this heavy lifting. And I agree that fiscal policy uh, matters, but it just seems uh, to be the other way. Is that just me? Or are people expecting too much of the Fed uh, and to, uh, to dodge the fiscal uh, policy or avoid making fiscal policy possibly? I don't know. I don't know how to quite phrase that, but... Well, Blaine, I think you're referring to a very real um, phenomenon in, in sort of the, the, the politics of, of economic policy. And that is that power at the Fed is highly concentrated. 
Mm -hmm. The Fed chair has a huge amount of power. And so there are many moments um, in kind of economic management when, gee, you know, the, the Fed chair stands up there and announces that, you know, interest rates, you know, gives a press conference after the meeting and says interest rates, we've decided to do this. And they pretty much just made that decision uh, without having to get legislation through Congress, without having to have hearings on the Hill. All that stuff is short circuited. It's a monarchical almost uh, form of power. Um, and so that's highly impressive when the Fed wields that power. And the same thing, of course, is true in spades during a crisis. So uh, there was this absolutely famous moment in uh, 2008 when Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, went to see Congress uh, and the big insurance company AIG was in need of a bailout and it was going under, it was going to create complete havoc in the financial system. And uh, Ben Bernanke said to various members of Congress he was meeting with, you know, we're going to provide a bailout for AIG, it's going to cost 85 billion. And a leading member of Congress, uh, Barney Frank, said, um, well, do you have 85 billion? And uh, Ben Bernanke said, sure, we've, we've got however much we want, because we can just print the money. So it's moments like that that bring home the awesome power of the Fed. But it's not a power that can address inequality. It's a very strong lever for bailing things out. It's a strong lever for cutting interest rates, for, for kind of creating spending power through the economy. It's not a targeted tool uh, for, for addressing inequality. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful answer, wonderful insight. I'm gonna pivot over here to a couple of questions in the question box and we'll go from there. Jamil uh, sends this one in and says, you mentioned pent up spending and the potential for a quick whoosh of spending as economies open up. Uh, so some academics have mentioned they are observing what economic and social structural changes COVID has caused. Do you think this whoosh of spending will be weighted more heavily towards education and skills development, public transportation, slash infrastructure, et cetera, rather than luxury goods and other consumables, or everybody just gets back in line at Disneyland, which I love Disneyland, but uh, you know, infrastructure versus discretionary travel. Um, where do you think that wish is gonna be weighted? Or where would you hope that wish is gonna be weighted? So I think, you know, the key distinction here is between private spending by families and uh, public spending by the government. Um, and I mean, there's the third category, which is corporate investment, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, government spending um, is, you know, first of all, as we've seen in President Biden's announced intentions about making sure there's enough stimulus in place uh, to support the economy as we emerge from the pandemic. I actually think he's going too far with that, but you know, that's a debate. Um, and I think beyond that, the second priority will be infrastructure with an emphasis on, on environmental goals, green infrastructure. Um, so getting in place uh, stuff like, um, I don't know, charging stations for electron, electric cars to be able to be used more broadly through the system. You know, you, you, you obviously need places to charge your electric vehicle if you're gonna have an electric vehicle. And I think government will get involved in that kind of infrastructure. Um, now, on the private side, when families uh, have got money to spend and they're allowed to go out and spend it, that will be more kind of back to where you were. It'll be the consumption that regular people have been holding back on and they kind of want to go back to it because it's fun. Yeah. I mean, I certainly would like to go have a vacation or you know, go to a restaurant. I'm not allowed to do that right now in London. Um, so I can't wait. <laughs> uh, and I don't think we should be in the business of, you know, morally judging people who want to go back and have some fun after the fun they've missed out on uh, in the past uh, year. So I think it's a mixture. I think corporate investment is the other category and the composition of that investment uh, may be influenced by government signals. So if the government, for example, um, puts in place policies that make it clear that uh, you know, there's going to be a shift towards uh, environmental, um, you know, decarbonization. Mm -hmm. You're going to get investment which is built around that. So there'll be more conversion to solar panels and wind power um, and so forth. Uh, and that does depend 
a bit on government signals. And I, I think this is one thing else to throw in the mix here. A, a really interesting question is whether people post COVID want to go back to living uh, sort of as they were in cities, mostly commuting to work every day, or are they actually happy to be telecommuting, doing what we're doing right now, doing stuff on Zoom? If you're happy to be remote working, maybe you don't need to live in a city, maybe you can go live somewhere cheaper where you get a bigger house for your family. I, I think that's a big shift that everybody will be watching and spending will be affected by that choice. Interesting, thank you. Another question here from Marco. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the Fed's injecting money into the economy isn't a major issue of late, uh, but does this translate into the national debt? So here it is, I knew it would come up. Does this translate into the national debt and that running large deficits may not be an issue uh, that it was in the past, or does it even still matter? This is, uh, Marco is wondering about that. Sure. So again, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a sort of two-part answer, right? Uh, the, the first answer is that the immediate question about debt is not so much how many dollars does the US government borrow, it's what is the cost of paying interest on the debt that it has. So it's the service cost uh, that, you, that the government has to pay because that's the drain on the US budget, that's the drain on taxpayers who have to pay for that budget. And because interest rates are very, very low at the moment, you can have a record stock of debt in dollar terms, and yet it's not a record at all in terms of the cost of paying for it uh, every month. And that's pretty much where we are. I mean, um, the record for uh, the stock of debt to GDP, I think was set right at the end of the Second World War. And we are right up around that same level. I haven't checked in the last month actually, but I think right around now we were due to cross over uh, that number and, and match the post second world war record. So that's a very high and very scary number in a way, but because interest rates are so much lower than they were in the 1940s, it's not actually a burden right now. Now, the question is, do interest rates stay that low and how long for? And, uh, I, that's where you have to go back to this question about inflation. If inflation remains invisible, uh, interest rates will stay low, uh, and it's probably not a problem for the moment to have that much national debt. If you get a surprise and inflation comes back, then the Fed will have to raise interest rates by kind of more than the inflation to get on top of that inflation. And that's where the debt will become expensive. And that's where you'll see uh, budget pain. It'll mean that tax cuts will be probably inevitable. This would be a repeat of what happened in 1990 and 1993, when uh, a sort of high national debt kind of combined with, you know, there had been the 1980s Reagan budget deficits. And because interest rates were higher then, by 1990, this was causing a big drain on the budget. And uh, although President H.W. Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes, he did raise taxes, that cost him the 92 election, but he sort of had to do it because of this, the size of the national debt. And then Clinton came into office in 93, uh, and he also raised taxes immediately. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you see inflation going up, you're gonna see interest rates going up, you're gonna see taxes going up, and then we're all going to feel like it does matter. Uh, tackle another question here from Kathleen, since it uh, wants to compare Europe and the U.S., and then we'll dive back into the U.S. economy. But since uh, I'm in the U.S. and you're in Europe right now, this is a natural one here. European monetary policy has pushed interest rates into negative territory, whereas the Fed has purposely avoided doing this. So clearly, Europe's economy continues to suffer more than the U.S. economy. How important do you think this difference in policy has driven the differential performance of the two economic areas? Um, so I think that, it, I mean, the, the, the premise is quite right, that uh, the European Central Bank has cut interest rates into negative territory. Mm -hmm. And the US, um, since it's not in such bad shape as Europe, has not done that. Uh, it's also a good thing the Fed hasn't done that because there's a lot of doubt as to whether 
negative interest rates um, are really a good idea. Uh, what happens is that uh, banks um, have a great deal of difficulty making any money uh, with negative interest rates. So it tends to uh, weaken the banking system and then you get less lending by banks and that can actually undo some of the stimulus that you're trying to create with a negative interest rate. So there's a bit of an argument about negative interest rates. On balance, um, the Europeans have decided that you can go a little bit negative, but only slightly. I forget where they are, but maybe zero minus 0 0.7 or something like that. Um, but I don't think they can go any further. So that's a very limited tool. You know, the Europeans um, have got economic growth problems for all manner of reasons, partly as demographic. Uh, the US um, has a younger population. Um, partly it's um, to do with technological in innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, the US is better at uh, venture capital and startups and tech uh, than Europe is. Um, and, uh, and it's just more of a pro-business environment in the US. Uh, and so I think for all these reasons, uh, the US has weathered uh, the challenges of the last decade uh, better than Europe. We've got about 20 minutes remaining. So I wanna chunk it into about two 10 minute blocks and get to the business and venture capital in that second 10 minutes. But let's go back to the post COVID American economy. We've certainly talked inflation a lot, but uh, let's grab a couple of other economic indicators. What about productivity growth? Uh, this has been a little stagnant uh, in some people's opinions. It's been a little stagnant. Productivity growth, any, um, any signals there on the road ahead or worries? Yeah, I think, you know, productivity growth is the um, big indicator that's really difficult to measure. Um, and so I think, you know, we were talking earlier about inflation. Do we know how to measure that and so forth? And there's legitimate debate, but I think when it gets to productivity growth, there's a, there's, there's a bigger debate. Um, and, you know, partly it is that if you think about, um, you know, how do you measure productivity, right? It's, it's, it's the amount of um, uh, income that a company earns per hour of labor that it's using. And if the company, you know, uses a bunch more labor, but um, and, and produces a bunch more stuff, but doesn't get more income for those sales because its particular product is, um, is, is getting cheaper, then you don't see a productivity rise. So to make that concrete, you know, think about the iPhone, right? Um, you know, Apple can, can build all kinds of new functionality into the iPhone. Um, it is putting prices up on, on iPhones, as, as those of you who buy them will have noticed. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say that uh, kind of for, for unit of what it can actually do, yeah, maybe the iPhone's falling in cost um, because of competition from Samsung, because it's, you know, with there's a kind of phenomenon known as tech beta where um, the uh, technology is getting as Moore's law would predict, the chips that go in are getting more powerful. And, you know, they can make it a bit more expensive, but, they, but their power is growing faster than their cost. Uh, and so it's difficult to measure rising productivity at Apple because they're producing something where the cost um, probably is rising less than the functionality. Um, and yet it's hard to believe they're not getting more productive because you know, over time they get better at what they do. Um, their own workers have more technology tools at their disposal. So I kind of expect that if you were to measure productivity based on kind of the consumer satisfaction created by the American economy, you would see productivity rising. And the fact that we don't have measured productivity going up is something to do with this, this mismatch. Um, um. And I've heard uh, similar arguments with GDP that it's just deficient in so many of these ways that we're not capturing because of the age of the measure and how, how I agree. We, the work. we won't uh, go down that road. Let's talk employment because we have a question about the minimum wage uh, situation, but uh, employment, uh, Sebastian, um, uh, duration of unemployment is getting a little bit longer. That's a little uh, worrisome. Uh, we certainly have you know, the COVID situation to depress that. 
uh, in there, but the post-COVID American economy um, employment, uh, any, anything you see there? You know, I think that, you know, there was debate um, perhaps six months ago um, when we were, I guess about six months into the COVID, into the COVID shock, when people were suddenly thinking, wow, this is really going to last a long time. And, um, you know, it's not just one wave, there's going to be two waves of this and so forth. And people at that point were worried about the long-term unemployment effect and the scarring that you get when folks are disconnected from the workforce, they tend to lose skills, they lose the habit of work, they get discouraged, demoralized, their mental health, frankly, can suffer. And, and you get this sort of system of this, this, this phenomenal long-term unemployment where it's very difficult to get people reconnected to the labor force. And that, that phenomenon known as, as labor market scarring um, was, was much debated. I actually think that employment has come back better than people feared relative to six months ago. And there's a decent chance that, you know, the recovery is going to be strong. If anything, there's a danger of overshooting uh, and getting some inflation. That the Biden stimulus on top of the stimulus we had at the tail end of the Trump administration is going to fuel this recovery. And there's just a lot of household spending power and pent up growth and that will create jobs and, and we'll see that employment number come back and cure quite a lot of this long-term unemployment. So, Wonderful. you know, I don't want to poo-poo it. I'm, I'm as a sort of, you know, moral, social and moral and social question, I'm, I worry a lot about inequality and, and, and folks who are on the losing end of, of, of the economy, but I'm hoping that it won't be too bad. Rosemary puts up this question. Uh, Biden wants to make the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, then two questions. How do you think this will affect inflation? And more pointedly, do you think that Biden should change the minimum wage to $15 an hour? So, You know, I, I have to admit, I've gone through an evolution on this question of the minimum wage. If you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have said, um, raising the minimum wage, generally a bad idea, because you raise the wage to a point where companies actually don't want to employ people. And they'd rather invest in some kind of machine that replaces the worker, or they'd rather import something from abroad that, in place, that replaces the worker, and therefore um, don't raise the minimum wage, you know, let the market set the wage. Um, I now have changed, and I think minimum wage at $15 an hour is on balance a good policy. And the reason I've changed is first of all, there was a bunch of empirical work uh, which was a bit mixed in its findings, but certainly didn't create a clear-cut body of evidence for the idea that you destroy jobs by raising the minimum wage. Um, and it turns out that, you know, if you pay people a bit more, they may be more motivated, they may work harder. And so the wage increase is sort of made up for by better productivity, by better, better workers. Uh, and therefore, it's not inflationary and it's not bad for a company. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to raise prices as a company because you pay people more but you get more work out of them and so it kind of evens out. And that, so that's one reason. The second reason is you know, inequality has become a real big issue and I think politically and for the good of capitalism as a believer in the market and as a believer in capitalism, you know, I'm pro-capitalist, uh, but I think you need the minimum wage to make capitalism work for everybody. And I think it's, it's worth it um, to, to put that in place. Uh, and, and I've changed my mind. Okay, thank you uh, for your candor there. Uh, we do have one other question in the question box. I would say this would be last call. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can uh, going through. But I'm gonna ask uh, Sebastian about that uh, final pool of money. The Federal Reserve is not the only consequential uh, financial institution in the United States or you know, pool of money out there. There's all this venture capital uh, out there. Um, uh, companies like Uber and Airbnb did not spring out of the Federal Reserve nor out of Washington, D.C. 
they've been enormously impactful on the economy. So how will the large and active pool of venture capital in the U.S. impact the post-COVID American economy? Is this an important advantage that the U.S. might have going for it? Well, Blaine, thanks for that question. Um, as you know, I've been um, sort of thinking about this subject intensively for, for five years because that's the subject of my next book, um, Venture Capital, how it came to be on the West Coast, how it's developed, how it's spread to China and so forth. Um, and I think you're right that this is an incredible advantage of the United States, that uh, in the US, there is um, the best, biggest, most creative uh, pool of venture capital in the world. And it has fueled extraordinary digital e e companies which create a comparative advantage. Now, there is a challenger out there, which has arisen in the last 20 years, and that's China. China um, was nowhere in terms of the digital economy or venture capital until the creation, roughly speaking, of Alibaba in 1998. Um, that company, by the way, was financed by US venture capitalists. So the US methodology was imported into China and the whole US Silicon Valley playbook was essentially you know, flown in and deposited in China. And that's what's caused China to flourish. And now China is good enough at it and sophisticated enough at it that it doesn't need the US anymore. And it has its own independent ecosystem. So what you see in the world in geopolitical terms is uh, two big technology finance systems, China and the US, uh, competing with one another, creating kind of rival uh, versions of the internet, um, which are often sort of in parallel because of the great firewall in China that keeps out, um, you know, Western uh, internet companies. Uh, and if you're a Chinese citizen, you, you can't, you, it's difficult to access Google or Facebook or whatever. You'd have to kind of get through the firewall of the Chinese censorship system. And that's tricky. Um, so that's the big, uh, that's a big dimension of the wider tension we see arising between China uh, and the US right now. I believe that the US one has an edge, the US system has an edge, because ultimately really creative people do want to live in a free society and China is not a free society. And so I'm hopeful that the US will win this battle. Uh, but I think that's a big thing to watch in the next uh, decade or so. Okay. Let me work on some of the questions in the question box. And if you have one on venture capital, that's a good one to ask. I don't see one uh, scanning through it initially, but we might grab one more of those. But uh, David uh, put in that historically, this one's pretty fine grain, uh, that historically economic cycles have been driven by inventory cycles. Uh, but with just-in-time, it changed all that. Uh, what impact will just-in-time logistics and digital technologies have on these economic cycles in the future? Are we do we not have to worry about this inventory cycle anymore given our digital technologies? Any thoughts on that, Sebastian? Yeah, I think that's a very smart point. And um, I completely agree that that is one reason why um, the, the traditional 1960s, 1970s style um, cycle has gone away. What we've had instead, and this gets to a big subject we haven't gotten to so far, it's nice to mention it at least, and was kind of at the center of my book about Greenspan, is that the uh, last couple of uh, economic cycles in the United States have been driven by uh, finance, by bubbles. So, you know, the, the, the bubble of 2000 in technology stocks burst, uh, and that created the 2001 shallow recession. And then the bubble in subprime mortgages burst, and that created the very deep 2008, 2009 recession. Um, and so I think looking forward, it wouldn't surprise me if the next cycle is also a financial bubble type of cycle. Uh, and although we haven't had inflation in um, normal goods, as it were, the price of eggs has been stable, as we've been discussing, the price of nest eggs has not been at all stable, right? Asset prices have been going through the roof in the stock market and real estate uh, and so forth. And so that is a worry in the background that mm -hmm. if you had a big correction uh, in financial markets, that could uh, destroy spending power 
um, in many ways across the economy and destroy balance sheets. And that would create a contraction. We do have a question on the equity market from Scott. Uh, again, very specific one, but we'll pitch it out there. It's, he says, speaking of people on the losing end uh, with GME and Robin Hood's and other brokerages decisions to restrict long-term positions on certain stocks, there's a perception that the markets are fixed in the direction of the financial elites. So what is the long-term impact of this growing perception on the equity markets that it's just a fixed game for financial elites? Yeah, I mean, that perception is clearly very strong. Um, uh, I think it's a bit too simple, but it's very strong. Uh, and I know this firsthand because I wrote an article in the Washington Post uh, over the weekend uh, about GameStop and about the Reddit uh, Wall Street Bets discussion board uh, and all that stuff. And I took the view that, you know, bidding up the price of a sort of bricks and mortar video game retailer uh, by 8,750% was nuts. I mean, this is a tulip bulb kind of bubble and it made no sense whatever. It wasn't going to be sustainable. And um, the people who were, who were shorting that stock, betting it would go down, who were the Wall Street hedge fund types, they were right. <laughs> and um, what I got in response was, I kid you not, um, well over 3,000 messages uh, telling me that I was siding with the rich elite on Wall Street against ordinary people. Now, that wasn't my point. My point was, you know, sometimes there are financial bubbles and prices don't make sense. Um, but the perception of all these readers was that I was defending the Wall Street elite that was already way too rich and shouldn't be defended. So I'm fully aware of that perception. And I think it's a problem in terms of managing financial markets well, because you know, that kind of view will sort of distort how we see things. I think, you know, the truth is we want short sellers uh, to keep financial markets honest because bubbles are disruptive and people who bet on things going down are healthy as a check on bubbles. And it's like the investigative press are a check on people in power. You want people who have a financial incentive because they're selling short to go do research on companies and see if they're committing fraud or doing other bad stuff. Um, this is healthy. Uh, but if we see them as fat cats and the elite and way too rich already, there's a danger that we'll wind up regulating them out of existence and that will only make finance less stable and that won't be good for anybody. Yeah. So I, I do worry about this. Losing that check and balance uh, would be tragedy uh, in that way. Um, well, Sebastian, we're, we're getting close to the end here. I'm going to uh, ask my closing question and I'll jump back into the question box if we can fit any more in. But uh, uh, hopefully we have some members of the Federal Reserve or some venture capitalists uh, listening in on this conversation um, and, and learning from it. I know I have. But uh, however, uh, I suspect that many of the people in the audience are what you just call ordinary citizens. You just said, you know, just ordinary people, students, teachers, entrepreneurs, you know, index-based investors uh, in there. Um, to address the challenges of the post-COVID American economy, what uh, counsel would you give just the, the ordinary people who don't have these levers at their disposal? Uh, what counsel do you have for them in the post-COVID post American economy, Sebastian? You know, to, to, to young people who are, who are students or who are just out of college or so forth, and I, I have four children who are Kind of around that age. Um, uh, you know, I think the most important thing, frankly, is, and I think in a way COVID brings this home, is actually to be happy, to, 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 to kind of zone out all this big picture stuff. If you can find something that you like doing that gives you satisfaction and that, you know, pays you enough to live on, and it's, and it's satisfying and, and you're engaged in it and you get that sense of flow, when doing it is something you lose yourself in because it's sort of immersive, that's the most valuable thing in life. And um, yeah, I would, I would go for that. So, you know, the world, COVID shows that the world is unpredictable, uh, that stuff um, can change, that what looked like a great career choice 10 years ago um, might change. It's not necessarily a great career choice anymore. 
But if you're doing something that you fundamentally enjoy, you've always got that to be happy about. And I think that's a huge strength. Well, a very encouraging answer. Uh, thank you for that. Um, as we close, I'll hand it off to Jim here in a moment, but I personally just want to thank uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth World Affairs uh, Council for hosting this event. It's been a joy to uh, be here and engage, and I want to thank those in the audience who sent in uh, really great questions that uh, kept it mixed up. I'm sorry, uh, especially to Raymond. I didn't get to your uh, question there. It's the next one up in the box. Uh, but uh, I'd also really want to thank uh, Sebastian uh, for being an observer and a witness and a chronicler. And uh, in line with that last answer, an encourager uh, in there. So uh, it's been a joy working with you today, Sebastian. Thank Great you so much, today. Blaine. And uh, I, I like the way we concluded the program. It was very optimistic. And I also always think, Sebastian, when I hear you, I wish you had been my professor of economics many, many years ago, <laughs> because you have a remarkable knack of explaining complex matters in a way that's quite understandable. And I, I do want to encourage our viewers to pick up a copy of your books if they've not yet done so. And I, I'm always happy when I see your, your articles in the Washington Post. How often do you have an article coming out in the Post? About every two weeks or so, or what is it? You know, Jim, it's episodic depending on how much I am immersed in my book, which I'm normally doing. So. Um, sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's once a month, and sometimes I don't write one for six months. The nice thing about the internet is that, you know, they can be flexible. When I write one, they publish it, and uh, I'm not tied to a fixed schedule as I used to be in the print world of many years ago. Now, I don't want to be your pushy publisher, but when will we see your book? <laughs> uh, it'll be out early 2022. Great. Well, we look forward to that. And again, thanks for joining us from London. And I do want to remind everyone who's watching that this is a very busy week at the World Affairs Council. We've already had two programs. And tomorrow we'll have our first program for 2021 in the Haynes and Boone International Perspective Series. And we'll be talking about climate insecurity with Sherry Goodman. She's at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. And that'll be at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we hope you can join us. And we appreciate Haynes and Boone for making these series of the series of programs possible. And of course, we thank Baylor. And we'll see you at the next uh, Baylor uh, Global Economic Global Business Forum. Have a, a great rest of your day. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>